Welcome to FFRF's Ask an Atheist, our first show of 2022. I'm Andrew Seidel, the Director of Strategic Response at the Freedom From Religion Foundation. I'm solo hosting today to discuss a crucial topic. But first, if you've got questions, you can ask them right here in the Facebook comments or send an email to askanatheist at ffrf.org. And remember, FFRF is a 501c3 nonpartisan organization, so not only do we happily accept your donations, we also do not and cannot take sides in partisan elections. But elections are really important, and they're going to be part of the topic for today's discussion, because one year ago, a mob attacked our capital and tried to overturn the results of a free and fair election. I delivered a talk at the FFRF convention a few months ago looking back at that attack and how Christian nationalism motivated and justified it. So we're going to play a few minutes of that presentation, and then I'm going to answer the questions that you have right here live. So please be sure to ask them in the comments or send that email. Now, let's take a look at the role that Christian nationalism played on the insurrection on January 6th, 2021. So why Christian nationalism is un-American is the subtitle of my book. It's not often that you choose a subtitle and then the subject runs out to prove you right. <laughs> but 10 and a half months ago, Christian nationalists attacked American democracy. They attempted to overturn the results of a free and fair election, and they proved beyond all doubt that Christian nationalism truly is un-American. For those of you who aren't familiar, Christian nationalism is the claim that America was founded as a Christian nation, that we were based on Judeo-Christian principles, and that we've strayed from that foundation, that we've gotten away from our godly roots. And they love the language of return, and they yearn for this golden past, and they claim to be the true heirs of the American experiment, and more importantly, the American identity. They're the true Americans, everyone else is an interloper. And for a long time, Christian nationalism was treated as a historical debate. Historians on one side and propagandists and politicians on the other side. But on January 6th, Christian nationalism ripped off its mask showing that it's not a scholarly debate about how America was founded, but a violent exclusionary movement bent on seizing power in the here and now. And the insurrection really launched this conversation that some of us, Anthea Butler, Andrew Whitehead, Sam Perry, Catherine Stewart, Robbie Jones, Chrissy Stroop, Sarah Posner, Michelle Goldberg, Jack Jenkins, Jeff Charlotte, and many others, we kind of been having this conversation on the margins, and it sort of launched that conversation into the mainstream. And since January 6th, I have been scouring the photos and the videos and the court transcripts of what happened that day. And just dipping your toe into this world is, is truly alarming, but I have immersed myself in it, and I am more convinced now than ever before about the role that Christian nationalism played in assaulting our democracy. And that research and submersion wasn't just for the new epilogue of the founding myth, but for a huge project that, that Todd just mentioned that you're gonna see released as we get closer to the anniversary. So stay tuned for that. I'm sure many of you, like me, watched in horror live as that assault unfolded. But I want to remind you of just some, just some of the Christian nationalism from that day. So Paula White began the rally with a prayer. And in true Christian nationalist fashion, she added the United States of America to the Lord's Prayer that is written out in Matthew 6. So she added America to a prayer that according to the Bible, Jesus himself wrote. And in that, same, in that same chapter, Jesus also tells people to pray in private, not in public, like the hypocrites <laughs> that can be seen to be praying by others. It's weird that Christian nationalists always ignore that biblical command. That rally ended, the rally that began with the prayer ended with Trump calling on his mob to march to the Capitol. His last words 
were the same that Nixon used to distract the country from Watergate. God bless you and God bless America. And if you've read the founding myth, you know all about the history of that phrase and how it was added to the end of presidential addresses very recently. Impromptu worship concerts broke out on the short walk. This is just one. I saw several, including what I'm pretty sure was a church choir, which I'm not gonna show. But here you have people wearing Trump flags and capes and red, red MAGA hats swaying and singing. Uh, and if I wanted to punish you for attending, I would make you listen to the song that is playing here, which is called The Revelation Song, which begins, Worthy is the Lamb Who Was Slain. On their march to the Capitol, the Proud Boys were hailed as God's warriors, and they knelt in prayer, full of typical Christian nationalist rhetoric about restoring the nation. They marched, and then they attacked. One attacker carried a Christian flag onto the floor of the U.S. Senate. Talk about marking your territory. The absurdly self-proclaimed QAnon shaman led a prayer in the Senate about patriotism, Jesus restoring the nation, and ended that prayer in Jesus' name. One of the praying insurrectionists gave an interview later, and he actually talked about that prayer. He referenced it, and he said, we consecrated it to Jesus. He meant the Senate. We consecrated it to Jesus. That, to me, is the ultimate statement of where we are in this movement. It is. A third praying insurrectionist posted a video saying, I just wanted to get inside the building so I could plead the blood of Jesus over it. That was my goal. That's him right there. He spends 40 minutes recounting every act, most of it pleading the blood. And he attributes every action to this dialogue that he had with Jesus during the attack. And he recounts the dialogue. God told him to do it. He also said that when he was going to go to prison for his crimes, that he was going to start a prison ministry. Another insurrectionist sipping a post-assault beer told her social media followers why she attacked the beating heart of American democracy. Let's take a listen. So to me, God and country are tied. To me, they're one and the same. We were founded as a Christian country. And we see how far we have come from that when they make an absolute mockery of us and pray to some heathen God and say, amen and a woman. What the fuck is that? We are a godly country. We are founded on godly principles. To me, God and country are tied. We were founded as a Christian nation. We are a godly country and we were founded on godly principles. The idea that we are a Christian nation and that we have slipped from those founding principles is a central tenet of Christian nationalism. And it's the primary justification for their harmful retrogressive action, like sedition and insurrection. The imagery is infamous by now. The huge wooden cross juxtaposed with the gallows from which they wanted to hang elected officials. They actually signed the gallows as if it were a yearbook, writing, hang them high, in God we trust, God bless the USA, hang for treason, amen. The flags and signs were clear. Jesus is my savior, Trump is my president, in God we trust, Jesus saves, Jesus 2020, Bible verses, crosses. One sign simply said, I am with you, God. There were Catholic images of Jesus or Mary on banners, paintings, statues, some born atop poles over the attackers' heads. A Bible verse was seen raised above the crowd like a Napoleonic eagle as the mob surges through the entrance into the Capitol. One of the people who entered the Capitol was a Catholic priest who admitted on camera to exercising the demon Baphomet while he was in there. And tell me what kind of a minister are you? What's the name of your church? Roman Catholic uh, from uh, oh, Catholic Nebraska. Priest. And so, um, uh, got this going, got these exorcism prayers going. I have this priest using them. Were you, did you do an exorcism at the Capitol? Yes, I did. What was that like? Um, we'll see. Did you see, 
did you, did you, did you, were you able to feel the effect of the exorcism? Not with our eyes, no. And what, what, what has possessed the capital? Um, there's a demon called um, Bahamut, and uh, exorcists have uh, found out that um, he's the one who is um, dissolving the country in order to um, bring it into something different. There's a demon Baphomet that was exercised from the Capitol. Did you happen to notice the flag over his shoulder? Proud American Christian with the Jesus fish. Another attacker was a youth pastor from Florida. Others were missionaries. They sang the battle hymn of the Republic in the rotunda. Glory, glory, hallelujah. His truth is marching on. They prayed in the rotunda. One group, the Jericho March, was founded by two federal workers who were sent visions from God to, quote, let the church roar. The Battle of Jericho was a genocide. In the story, the biblical God orders his followers to march around the city blowing shofars, ram's horns, and carrying the ark holding his commandments. And then they violently sack the city, steal all the valuables, and murder every living thing in there, including the animals. So the Jericho March baptized itself after a biblical genocide and then reenacted that slaughter by blowing shofars, marching around government buildings in D.C. and in state capitals, declaring that this is one nation under God, and organizing rallies alongside the Stop the Steal charlatans. And it wasn't just imagery and rhetoric. It was a devout belief that this is a Christian nation and that God chose Donald Trump. And Trump himself said so. I am the chosen one. Do you remember that? I am the chosen one. The attacker who kicked in Speaker Pelosi's door, hoping to, quote, tear her into little pieces, was an attorney. His rantings were recounted at one of his hearings after he was charged. He said, God is on Trump's side. God is not on the Democrats' side. And if patriots have to kill 60 million of these communists, it is God's will. There were, of course, other motivations and drivers of the attack, but this Christian nationalist permission structure, doing God's will, fighting for God's law, returning the country to its Christian roots, it pervaded all the other obvious drivers of the attack. For instance, the insurrection had a distinct QAnon flavor, but study after study is exposing the link between QAnon and Christian nationalism and QAnon and or white evangelicalism. And that's actually why I chose this particular photo. This is white MAGA Jesus. It may be the most representative symbol of the day. Uh, it's Peter V. Bianchi's original portrait, I am the way, the truth, and the life. It's a very popular American depiction of Jesus though first century residents of the Levant did not look like that white man. Jesus, if he existed, was definitely not white. And nor did he wear a MAGA hat. Uh, but they, they photoshopped in the MAGA hat, and then they also photoshopped onto JC's white robes. That is the QAnon motto, WWG1WGA, where we go one, we go all. So it's Q and whiteness wrapped up in Christian nationalism. And this was a largely white crowd. The Black Lives Matter protesters in DC neither received nor expected such leniency that summer, as this New York Times video shows. When the looting starts, the shooting starts. Trump warned about that in May 2020, quoting a phrase that's got a very long and racist history. So Trump had these peaceful protesters gassed and beaten and brutalized with rubber bullets so that he could walk to a church and pose with a Bible for a photo op. And the point of that malignant stroll was to show that we are a Bible-believing, Bible-beating Christian nation, and anyone who disagrees with that deserves to be beaten and gassed. And that scene harkens back to some of America's most shameful histories. So to speak of Christian nationalism is to speak of white Christian nationalism. So this privileged mob roamed the halls without fear, brazenly entitled. Perhaps they mistakenly believed that Trump would pardon them, but they certainly believed that this is their country given to them by their God and that they are acting on his orders and defending his chosen one. And when reality collides with a belief system like that, 
violence is almost inevitable. Entitlement and violence. And all of it based on disinformation. Christian nationalism is an entire identity based on disinformation. It's not a scholarly debate about our history. It is a sinister exclusionary movement. It is an attempt to redefine America according to the Christian nationalist identity and disinformation, and then to reshape our law accordingly. And you've heard the disinformation before many, many times. We're one nation under God. In God we trust. The Declaration of Independence references the Christian God four different times. The Founding Fathers prayed during the Constitutional Convention. George Washington knelt in the snow at Valley Forge in prayer. Our laws are based on the Golden Rule. Our laws are based on the Ten Commandments. None of that's true. And without their origin myths, their identity withers. Their entire political and ideological reality is incredibly weak and vulnerable because it's based on disinformation. It also becomes clear when you explore the myth and lies that this truly is an un-American political ideology. It's not just that the identity is based on disinformation. It's bigger. It's that Judeo-Christian principles, and especially those principles that are central to the Christian nationalist identity, are thoroughly opposed to the principles on which the United States was built. The two systems differ and conflict in fundamental in, and irreconcilable ways. We can beat Christian nationalism. We can relegate it back to the fringe whence it came by exposing the disinformation that feeds that identity. Now, we can't convince all Christian nationalists to change, but we can alert most of the country to the danger and prevent our government from giving aid and comfort to that un-American identity that assaulted our democracy. Again, the entire identity is based on lies and myths, but it's validated by modern representations of those myths that previous Christian nationalists have imposed on the country during crises. The erroneous beliefs are validated when they see in God we trust on our money or on a government building, or when they're told as school children that we are one nation under God, or when Congress opens with prayers that assure every Christian nationalist that this is indeed his America. The Ten Commandments monuments that sit on government property proclaiming, I am the Lord thy God. The Christian nationalist identity draws legitimacy from these artifacts left by previous waves of Christian nationalists. These relics are disfiguring scars. They ought to remind us that Christian nationalists have justified slavery, sanctified segregation, and now inspired an insurrection. Instead, the scars reinforce that un-American identity. And until we erase those scars, we are giving aid and comfort to a traitor, to this un-American philosophy. America is a shared idea, and Christian nationalism refuses to share. It excludes non-Christians and the wrong kind of Christians. America will never be a Christian nation, because the moment it becomes a Christian nation, it will cease to be America. The two cannot peacefully coexist. One will triumph, and that is the choice that we face as a nation, Christian nationalism or America because we can't have both. Thank you. So thank you for watching that. Now I'm gonna take questions. I just wanna reiterate that a year out from that, we know five people died on that day. Two police officers who were involved committed suicide in the days following that, and then another two uh, in the months following, though uh, authorities have been reluctant to tie those directly to the insurrection. 700 people have been arrested and charged in connection with the attack so far, but we still haven't identified everybody who was involved. Uh, the person who had carried that Christian flag onto the floor of the U.S. Senate and was rifling through senators' desks and taking pictures of their papers, we don't know who that person was. He's not yet been identified or arrested or charged. So there's still a lot of investigation and information that still needs to be done and gathered. Um, and we got a ton of questions coming, so I'm going to try to get to those. Um, and one 
Art M asked, whatever happened to thou shalt not kill? They killed a cop and trampled one of their own to death. Yes, I mean, this was a violent assault. And I, a big part of the problem here is if you believe that God is on your side and that God is telling you to do something, all of a sudden, anything becomes permissible, right? And even, even when Moses is given the Ten Commandments, what, and I, I talk about this in the founding myth when I explain how the Ten Commandments are not the basis of American law, after God gives Moses the Ten Commandments in the Bible, which say thou shalt not kill, what does he do? He goes out and orders the death of 3,000 of his friends, brothers, and uh, allies. I mean, the first thing they do after getting the Ten Commandments is go kill 3,000 people. Uh, so there's, that happened because they had a license from God, a divine command to go do something that was greater than these other strictures. And that is the same kind of rhetoric that they were employing throughout from November 3rd all the way up through January 6th. Uh, I, was, I was not at all surprised by the violence that we saw that day. And in fact, I'll say, I also think we got very lucky. I think it could have been a lot worse, a whole lot worse. We have a troll in the comments talking about, oh, it was just old people taking selfies with each other, which is fundamentally not true. People did die that day. But there is and was a performative aspect to the day, right? If you watch those videos, uh, everybody was filming. Everybody had their phones out and was filming. They were, take, they were taking selfies. And if they had put those phones down and used two hands to attack, I think the day would have gone differently. You know, two or three seconds here or there, and the day would have gone differently. We could have, we almost, it could have been a lot uglier. Uh, you know, in, the, in one of those videos at the end, you see uh, Officer Goodman saving Mitt Romney's life, I believe. Um, you know, a couple of seconds here, a couple of seconds there, and the day would have been much, much different, and we'd be in a much different place as a country. So we have another question uh, from <clears throat> Liz, and I'm not going to try to pronounce your last name, Liz. Liz S. She said, recently at Christmas, my uncle got on the topic of the insurrection. He told me that the violence and rioting at the Black Lives Matter protests was worse than the violence on January 6th. How would you respond to that argument? I, I think it's really useful to compare the BLM protests from that same summer with what happened a few months later uh, on January 6th. Because if it had been BLM protesters who had gone into the Capitol, broken their way into the Capitol, breached police lines, torn down barriers, broken windows, kicked in doors, tried to get at public officials so that they could hang them, tried to bust through doors, so that they could grab public officials, vaulted over railings with zip ties so that they could perhaps kidnap public officials, the outcome would have been far different. I, I, we would have seen far more protesters get shot, I think. I, I think that comparison is more in the reaction of, of the authorities than anything else. And there, there is, because of the overreaction of the authorities uh, to the BLM protests, there is, some investigation suggesting that that's one of the reasons that they didn't stop some of what happened on January 6th uh, because they had been essentially told to take it easier uh, on people who are protesting. Uh, but January 6th was not a protest. Uh, as soon as you, you cross into areas where you are not allowed to go, you're no longer protesting. Uh, and, of course, they claimed that this was their house all the time. But they also did $1.5 million worth of damage to the U.S. Capitol as well. So I think that comparison is useful. I think it's better to compare what would have happened had the BLM protesters done exactly what the January 6th insurrectionists had done and how would they have been treated by the police and the authorities in that situation had, had the roles been reversed. And I think everybody knows the answer to that. I don't think I need to, to go into it. Um, Phil Monroe asks, so what can we do to counter and prevent this from a success in the future? I think that's the big question, Phil. Because January 6th was, in the way it was the culmination of Christian nationalism, but it's certainly not the end. It has not gone away. The big lie has not gone away. Uh, th this is still very much alive and a threat to our democracy. Perhaps a bigger threat. We are seeing consequences for some people. 
But right now it's all the low level people, the people who were actually on the ground breaching the barricades at the Capitol, not the people who were influencing them, telling them to do that, uh, the people in positions of power. Uh, we're not seeing that kind of accountability, uh, hopefully yet. We're not seeing that kind of accountability yet. We need to see some of that. Um, the number one thing I think we need to be doing, uh, especially in the secular movement, is combating the disinformation that underlies the Christian nationalist identity. Uh, that, that to me is, is the one thing that we can really be doing to get at this. It's why I wrote The Founding Myth. It's why I've been, wrote an epilogue uh, regarding January 6th. It's why I've been out there speaking about this constantly. I think that is the big thing that we can be doing because their entire identity, as I said in the talk, is based on lies and myths and disinformation. And that means that their identity is incredibly weak and vulnerable if we can help counter that. So, um, FFRF co-president Dan Barker asks, did the insurrectionists include any identifiable atheists? Um, not that I saw. Uh, there were quite a few uh, religious figures. I mean, we, we saw the, the Roman Catholic priest who went in and uh, performed an exorcism. There was another pastor uh, who claimed that the last time he was in the Capitol, he had been touring it with David Barton, talked about how he went to Karis Bible College in Colorado. Uh, you know, there were a number of religious figures there, um, but I didn't hear anybody talking about atheism or recognize any open atheists in anything that I was doing. I'm sure there were people there who were not religious and didn't believe in God, but um, really, of course, and let's back up, because there were a ton of identities on display that day, right? There, there was the Second Amendment uh, folks, there's the, the militia people, there's the white supremacists, there's the QAnon, all these different strands and identities and motivators and justifications were there that day, but the one thing that unified them was the Christian nationalism. You know, I spoke to the New Yorker reporter, Luke Mogelson, the journalist who filmed that, that infamous New Yorker video, which captured uh, the QAnon shaman saying the prayer from the Senate dais and everybody praying together. And that was the one thing that really struck him from that day as he and I were talking. He, he was talking about how there's all these different groups and identities there, but the one thing that shocked him was how Christianity really tied all of that together. It was the through line that united all those disparate identities and gave them the permission they needed to attack. Let's see. Um, Dudley Harkins, should we investigate propaganda and misinformation that may have been involved in this attack? I, mean, I think I, we know where a lot of that came from. You know, I, in, the, in the talk I mentioned how this January 6th did not happen on that day instantly. It didn't happen in a vacuum. There were many dry runs, um, including the day before. Uh, on December 12th, there was uh, the Jericho March. There was a, a, another rally at the Supreme Court. Uh, on November 14th, there was the Million MAGA March. There was all these different dry runs where they, they had these same speakers come deliver the same message. We are chosen by God. Trump is chosen by God. We have to do what God wants us to do. And then pitching everything as this mythical battle between light and dark, between Christians and everybody else. Satan, basically. And that message was pounded into their heads and then wrapped in the big lie over and over and over and over and over and over again. And it was, it was, it was propaganda and disinformation just on repeat for, for days and weeks and months until you hit January 6th. Rose Morgan, how can we best respond to people who ardently believe that America was founded to be a Christian nation? I mean, that, I think that's a fantastic question, and that is like literally exactly why I wrote this book. Um, I, I wrote this book to end that argument. I, the book came out in 2019. I just released it with an epilogue um, a couple of weeks ago. I have not, to this day, heard a new argument about why America was founded as a Christian nation. Everything I have refuted in that book itself. Um, they have no new arguments, they just recycle the same old stuff over and over and over again. And the thing that I try to do in The Founding Myth is give you the best arguments out there to push back against that disinformation. Because I've had these arguments for a decade, right? So it's not just saying, you know, oh, the Treaty of Tripoli says differently. 
there are better arguments than that. And I lay them out, you know, step by step in the founding myth. So if you want to know how to do that, want to know how to refute that disinformation, this, I think, is your best tool. Uh, and if you buy it from the FFRF store, um, when you check out, uh, if you add in the comments bo uh, block that you would like a signed copy, I'm happy to sign it and personalize it for you. Um, I also, any copy that is sold through FFRF, I donate uh, most of the royalties back to FFRF. Um, so you're also supporting the work that we do here, fighting Christian nationalism at the Freedom From Religion Foundation. Um, Linda J comments, I've recently listened to a podcast about the, wom the woman crushed by the crowd at the insurrection. She was non-political until six months before the insurrection when she'd been thoroughly radica radicalized. It's very concerning that an average person can change in that amount of time. It is. It really is. And I mean, I think this is one of the things that we're seeing uh, with social media and, and the power of social media and, and that, the power of those algorithms uh, to keep you in front of what is going to keep you on the app so that you, and I, I won't get into, that's a whole, that, let's just say that's a whole nother show. I agree, Linda. I think that is, it is deeply disturbing how quickly this can happen. And I also think that one of the reasons that Christian nationalism was such a force on that day is because it provided this structure for a lot of these lies and these myths and these conspiracy theories to build on. Right? They've, they've already willingly suspended their disbelief, their skepticism, uh, their reason to believe, uh, for instance, that somebody r rose from the dead after three days of, after being crucified. Right? And they've already suspended it in that sense. And if you can piggyback onto that suspension of disbelief or suspension of skepticism, your conspiracy, conspiracy theory is much more likely to be accepted. Um, and that's one of the reasons I think though I haven't seen um, confirmation yet, I'll say, why you see, for instance, QAnon so popular in evangelical churches, the QAnon conspiracy theory. We know there's that link. We don't necessarily, uh, we haven't necessarily figured out the, the pathway that, that has caused that link yet, the causal connection. Um, but it does exist, and there have been a number of studies that are showing that. Okay, looks like we have a couple more. Um, so what's the best way forward? A carve out in filibusters for voting rights, find a way to expand or unpack the Supreme Court, continuing to appoint federal judges, speaking up as individuals, what else? Um, and that's a great question. I think all of those things are absolutely crucially important and that's something that we've talked about on this show many, many times. It's something that I'm, I'm constantly talking about. I do think we need a fix for the Supreme Court. I do think it need, it is an absolutely broken body that we need to fix. I do think we need democracy reform with a small d, democratic reform across the board, all these things we need in our country. And I do think that they are secular issues. We've written about them. We also, of course, need a fix for climate change because <laughs> we've got that coming down the line. And, you know, for the pandemic that we are still dealing with. Uh, th there's a lot that is, that is going on. When it comes to Christian nationalism, as I said at the end of that talk, I really do think it is possible for us to relegate it back to the fringe whence it came. Right? We're not gonna eradicate Christian nationalism. It is always going to be around, um, but we can push it back to the fringe where it has no political power. Uh, and, and we do that, I, I really think we do that by, by fighting the disinformation and by getting uh, active politically. So that is the last question. We, uh, there are a couple trolls, I guess, who are asking some questions, but I'm not gonna feed the trolls because you guys ask much better questions, the, re the, the real folks out there. So that's our show for this week. Uh, thank you for joining us. Please pick up a copy of The Founding Myth, Why Christian Nationalism is Un-American on paperback and read that new epilogue about January 6th. And stay tuned to FFRF News because we have a big project on January 6th that is gonna be dropping soon. And be sure to check out FFRF's broadcast television program, Free Thought Matters, which you can watch on TV stations around the U.S. or on FFRF's YouTube and Facebook channels. This week's guest is U.S. Representative from Virginia, Don Beyer, a member of the Congressional Free Thought Caucus. And in this preview, he talks about the problem of mixing church and state. So I have been so dismayed over the last 40 years of my political engagement by the way 
um, people's religious beliefs um, have interfered with other people's beliefs, religious or not, uh, in, in terms of public policy. And, uh, you know, I think most of history, you go back to the 2000 years that that's written down, um, we see really awfully things, awful things coming out when one person imposes his religious or her religious beliefs on another. So uh, I, I treasure the fact that I'm from Virginia, where Thomas Jefferson wrote the first statute of religious freedom, uh, separating church and state. And I think we eat away at that little by little. And I think I want to be part of the team that's fighting to preserve that secular uh, democracy in which we live. So refreshing to hear members of Congress talk like that. And this week on Free Thought Radio, Annie Laurie Gaylor and Dan Barker talk with former Christian apologist and scholar John Loftus about his new book, God and Horrendous Suffering. So you can go to ffrf.org slash radio to learn how to listen to Free Thought Radio. And if you want more information about the Freedom From Religion Foundation, go to ffrf.org. That's our website. And we will be back next week, Wednesday at noon Central Time, with another episode of FFRF's Ask an Atheist. Freedom.